Also, thank you for the talk. Well, uh, this is a very, very recent article of us. It's not submitted yet on, on our side. Oh, we wanted to. Oh, we wanted uh, to submit it before the talk. Unfortunately, the simulations are still running, but uh, hopefully tomorrow or tonight we can submit something. So I'm open for your criticism. Maybe I can implement some things. Um, as it's the afternoon talk and uh, we are all a bit tired, let's start with the motivation. So why is this important? Um, the amount of visual data has really exploded to a ridiculous amount in, in the last couple of years. And this is mainly because of all the sensors on this bird. Uh, probably all of you have a smartphone with one, two, or even three cameras on it, which means that in average we have more smartphones than people. So yeah, there's a ridiculous large amount of images. And one more, more statistics, which I really like, is the one of YouTube, uh, which shows that every second of clock time, there are approximately eight hours of videos uploaded in, in, in YouTube. And if we compute this for a day, this means that there are 720,000 hours of, of videos, which are approximately 82.2 years of videos every day. And yeah, I know Google has a, a lot of hardworking employees, but I think it's hard to find someone who's sitting down and watching, categorizing all this stuff. But if Google wants to serve us with the, with the videos for a topic we are searching for, we need to find a technology which is able to generate and understand all these um, visual data automatically. And gladly, smart people already found this algorithm. The networks are called deep convolutional neural networks. I think all of you heard about it. They actually had their breakthrough in 2012 when Alex Krzyzewski trained successfully the AlexNet and uh, won the ImageNet competition. And since then, many, many different uh, image recognition tasks are solved by them. Just to name two examples, Facebook's photo tagging is, is working with the CNN and also in the development of self-driving car by detecting um, like traffic signs, it's, it's used. Yeah, and there are famous uh, networks like Lynet, AlexNet, and GoogleNet, which are all based on CNNs. Um, and as in, in most of the other deep learning applications, there's still a huge gap between the practical applications and the theoretical understanding. But when we, when we consider convolutional neural network, it's, it's not only the network architecture, but it's also the understanding of image classification. And while I was writing this article with Johannes, um, we, we found this picture. And for me, this illustrates perfectly um, why it's, it's such a hard task to, to grab. So I think most of you, or maybe all of you, my flatmate didn't re recognize it, but maybe all of you uh, see instantly that this is an old man who is sitting on a park bench. But now ask yourself, how did you know that? I mean, his face is totally obscure. His, ha his hand is merging with his nose. The most distinct shape is his head, but by itself it could be anything. And also his jacket is merging at many points with the, with the background. So there's really no reason why we, why we see this person as a man. But when we glance at this picture, we see the man and all of his part distinctly. The problem is now how can we formalize what is going on in a mathematical manner? And this is neither a trivial task nor easy to solve. People try to, to do that. People try to analyze image classification. And there are actually two perspectives. And maybe some of you now um, tell me that this is not the machine learning perspective. So maybe it's more perspective one, perspective two. But the one perspective is that um, image classification is considered as a high dimensional problem, high dimensional object recognition problem, where each pixel is considered as a variable and where the task then is that we map these pixels to either the conditional probabilities or the labels. But this makes the image, uh, the function recovery harder if we increase dimension. And we all know the curse of dimensionality. So we get slow rate of convergence in the high uh, dimensional spaces. But this finally gives, doesn't, uh, doesn't give us an explanation why are these networks, for example, so good, especially in the high dimensional spaces. 
Um, so what people do is they restrict the functional relation between input and output. For example, they, they assume something like, okay, this lies on a latent low dimensional space. And there are many, many other ideas. I don't want to talk about this today. But there's also another, uh, another perspective. Uh, what about viewing an image as a two-dimensional object? This makes image classification way harder, but if we increase the number of pixels, we have more function values available, which means that, in, that we get a higher image resolution and we should find classifiers which are even better when we increase the dimension. And this is exactly the perspective we were analyzing in the last nine months. And um, we, uh, we considered um, or we introduced a deformation model which relies on the idea that many images of the same object can be generated by applying some proper deformations. And it's really just the starting point. So please don't criticize me for that it's really restricted the deformations, but yeah, I, I want to tell you uh, what kind of model we, we analyzed. So first of all, okay, we see an image as a two-dimensional object, as I, I said, and then we say each pixel value can be described by a function, which is then evaluated on the pixel value J over D and L over D. We call F here our template function, and this is not negative. We assume we have grayscale values and, um, what you can think about now is that when this function value here gets smaller, this corresponds to a darker pixel value. So here for, for this background here, the pixel values are zero and the, the lighter pixel correspond to a higher function value. And then we applied three different deformations. And the first one is actually pretty easy. What we did is we multiplied these pixel values with a random illumination factor. What does this mean? We can make the image lighter or darker. Um, when we multiply, so when we choose, so eta is positive, but when we assume that eta is smaller than one, then all pixel values here get smaller, which, which results in an object which, uh, which looks a bit like this one here. And when we, on the other hand, multiply it with a, with a factor which is larger than one, then we get something like this here, so all pixel values get lighter. The second thing we were con considering were some shifts. And how can we um, apply or how can we describe some shifts? What we do is we subtract on, the, on both inputs um, a constant tau and tau prime. By subtracting here a tau in the first component, this means that we can shift the image on the, or the object on the x-axis. And by subtracting some, some constant on uh, tau prime, we can shift it on the y-axis. This in turn means that we get here these shifted versions of, of, of four from the MNIST data, okay? Yeah. Yeah, please. Um, so this shifts is okay, but it's, it keeps the orientation. So why not using a rigid body motion, like also a rotation? Yeah, 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 it's a good point, and this would be one of the extensions I wanted to tell you in the end. So the idea would be to extend this model in a way that you define a set of constant shifts, something like um, a function. So the tau and tau prime are then functions, and then you can describe local deformations, rotations, and stuff. But, uh, but this makes it much more harder to to analyze a classifier. But that's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The last thing we were considering are scaling factors. And uh, what we did is we multiplied both inputs with the factor xi, xi prime. And this is actually the, the hardest to understand. So if we multiply here the, the x component with a, with a xi, which is smaller than one, then this leads to an um, object which is stretched in the, on the x-axis. So it gets wider. Yeah, please. I had a question just regarding the boundary conditions. So when you have one image and you shift it, how do you kind of impaint that part that, that was not previously defined? You know what I mean? No, I don't know. Okay. Is it a cyclic shift or a... Yeah, exactly. Do you, use a boundary, right? uh, do you use periodic uh, boundary conditions or how do you fill in? It's an R2. So say you have a, a square thing and then you shift up the square by half. Yeah. <laughs> 
Then the lower half is yeah, empty, right? But it's a picture on the whole plane. Yeah. Oh yeah, here they are. That's true. Yeah, you move the picture on the whole plane. So you mean you you're talking about shift or so he saw that this, or... he saw the picture was defined just on the square. And then ah, okay. Okay, okay. Well, re real pictures, real photos are on squares or rectangles. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what do you do if you move it over? You, you, what, and especially if they're not there wasn't. Especially if they're not clearly black all on the boundary, then it gets really tricky. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, we're not. This is really like a, a play example, right? Good. I mean, it's it's the data. It's pretty like a simplification. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, okay, um, so if you multiply here with a factor which is smaller than one, this makes the, the on the x-axis larger, the same for the y-axis, and it happens this, it gets smaller when we multiply it with a, with a factor which is larger than one. So then we get this smaller number of four. Okay, and then finally we include all these three deformations in our model. So in the end, we describe each pixel value in this way here. F is our template function, as I said. Then we have this random illumination factor, the, the constant shifts, and the, the different scalings. Okay? Deterministic, yeah, it's not random. It's, you can, it can be chosen random in the end. So it can be a random variant, but it's like one uh, univariate. Okay. Yeah. And and you just use the discrete value at that point, because obviously once you scale the thing, then one pixel, which was previously one color, doesn't perfectly fit yeah, anymore. Yeah. You take the value at the point and not some average. Some, in exactly, some... yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, in the end, we only have the values on, on the grid of our pixels. Okay, and as I said, we're talking about binary classification today. So we have, in the end, or we are, try to solve a data set of n pairs, x, i, k, i, k, i are our labels, binary classification. The simplest example is distinguishing cats and dogs. So k i is either zero or one. Trophy used minus one, one, but I mean, it's exactly the same. And okay, each of these pixel values are then described by our model. And important to notice here that this this template fetch function now depends on the label our image corresponds to. So it's either a template function F0 or F1. And of course, these functions are unknown and the, the deformation factors are randomly uh, independently chosen. Okay. And as I already said, we assume that the template fun functions are not negative. Furthermore, we say that the brightness factor have to be positive, and this results that all the pixel values are also non-negative. Furthermore, we consider images without any background noise and with only one object on it. This means we can describe this support by the support of a function, which is the set of all arguments where the functions are larger than zero by the object itself. So the support of the template function describes the true object, for example, our four we saw before, and the complement of the support is, is then the, the background. Yeah. Only have two images that you are sampling from, F0 and F1. No, no, it's the, it's the materials. Think Once of it as two materials. You, you have you the dogs, white for and example. black. You have like shifted versions and scaled versions. Yeah, but, but the four stays the same or something, and you just shift it. Exactly. So yeah. You don't have like different background or different something. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's easier to think of two numbers. Yeah, yeah. Three yeah. And four. Yeah. Where we could do these yeah, and we yeah. could later think about rotations and yeah. so on. Yeah, yeah. Cats don't always yeah, look like true. shifts of other yeah, cats. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So maybe it's better to think about the MSA yeah. that have two numbers. Okay. <clears throat> so okay, and it means that if you want to do it in a normal image, you first need some pre processing and make the image as a like just keeping the shapes of the forms, like just the shapes that you have on your, on your image, and the background has to be a black thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and there we considered two, two different classifiers. And the one, the first classifier is actually based on the idea that we search the object on our image and then we scale it on zero one uh, on the unit cube. And this, in this way, we, we generate a classifier which is not depending anymore on our scaling and the shifts. 
and I will will um, will explain the transformation we performed in more detail. But we need more assumptions. The first one is the object has to be completely visible on the image. And in mathematical terms, this means that the support of the deformed template functions has to be in zero one squared. Have to be very small, basically. Exactly. This is the point I wanted to say next. Um, so the the shift and the scaling have to be shown relative to each other. So when when we have a C which is pretty small, this corresponds to a large large object, and this in turn means we have like a restricted restricted possibility of shifts. And vice versa. So, so the shift is just like a little noise, like coming from a wiggling camera or something. Or I mean, it depends. Stand. When you have a super small image, you can shift it. Like have much options to shift it on the image. It, it really depends how how big your your object is in the end. I mean, when you model the shift as random, you think of it as as a process that this is something that happens through the measurement. A measurement error or, or like someone like holding a camera that wiggles or or how should i think of it well as or a like the person that writes the four for the amnesty data set is putting his pen pen down a bit further to the left than the other person right. so some measurement error yeah, yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> um okay and the second assumption we do is that we assume that the template functions are lipschitz okay Primarily, you want to kind of average out you don't care where the thing is on the image. So, like, if I actually image, what is the physical interpretation of, of the tau in random? That the left left guy will write more on the left, right uh, right handed guy more on the right before. It's more like it's an invariant. So it's located on the on the background. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and the idea is now what we what we have to compute in the beginning to scale this object on, on the uh, unit square is that we have to compute the, we call it a rectangular support of the function. And here you see this object and the, the red line actually marks the true rectangular support of, of the object. But as we only have like the pixel values given, we cannot compute the true one, we, we have to take the First pixel values, which is non, which is larger than zero, and the the last one, and then we get this this blue rectangular support here instead. And we will later see that we need a bit of notion of regularity to make sure that the true rectangular support and the one we can compute are close to each other. Okay. And then we define our transformation by this function z of t and t squared. And what is happening here is that this line here starts when we set t equal to zero with the first um, index which has a non-negative uh, which has a non-zero index okay and then it move you move through the through the image and map the whole object on zero one squared and this leads to a transformation with which is independent of random scaling and shift but still the object depends on the brightness factor so what we do is that in the end, we normalize this uh, function by the L2 uh, norm. And then we are also have a transformation which is, which is in the, independent to this brightness factor. And here you, you see what is happening with this transformation. So we search the rectangular support and map it then on, on 0, 1 squared. Okay. And our classifier in the end is a one nearest neighbor classifier. So we compute for each. Uh, image we have in our training data, we compute a transforma transformation and compare it to the transformation of the new image and choose then the image which is the closest in terms of the transformation to the new image and then we choose just the label of this guy. And okay, the one nearest neighbor estimator is an interpolating classifier. So when X is just equal to one of the training uh, samples, then it's exactly this label. Okay. And as I said, we need some sort of, of um, regularity. Yeah. Matt, you can go yeah. back a page. I just want to say this is, feels very comfortable. So, as, as someone who started undergraduate studies in the 1970s, this is what we were taught. You know, this is the way, like from Duda and Hart, a book written in the 60s on pattern recognition. This is how you conceived image classification tasks. 
Mm -hmm. And I've been so disheartened with this very natural way of thinking about something kind of preliminarily to do. It's so ignored in today's deep nets that just throw the whole boom and image into, you know, without any regard to these questions of location and scale and so on. And uh, it's like they forgot about what we were taught in the, in the 60s and 70s and 80s. So uh, thank you for going back to the foundation. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for valuing it. <laughs> um, as I said, we, we need some sort of regularity or notion of regularity to make sure that the that the rectangular support of the, the template function itself and the one we can sample with the pixel values are close. And we introduced so-called gamma sets. And um, so C is now our closed and connected set, and we describe the boundaries of this set by a parameterized curve, and this curve is closed, okay, then um, phi of zero is um, phi of one. And then we call um, a set a gamma set if it fulfills this reverted triangle inequality. And I think the easiest is if I illustrate it quickly in the image. So this is now our, um, our set. And then we take two values on the boundaries. So it's our phi u and our phi w. And what does this inequality now tells us? So these two, two points are now connected by two arcs. So let's say this is A1, this is A2, okay? So we can either go this way or this way. And this inequality now tells us that at least one arc exists where we can take each point on it such that when we, so let's, let's just take randomly this one here and describe it by uh, phi V, exactly like in the notation here. So if we go from, here to here and then to here, this distance should be at most lambda uh, gamma times the, the direct distance between the two points. And this means that the bigger gamma is, the more thin can be the set, okay? Because then you get a huge distance between the points. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And let me comment a bit on, on the definition. So first of all, we have to see, okay, if, if we assume that the template function itself is um, a gamma set, then the deformed version of the template function we will consider later for, for the model. So the gamma changes a bit. And it changes only when the scaling factors are chosen differently. But of course, if you use the scaling in both directions the same, it gets only bigger. So the gamma, gamma stays exactly the same. But it changes if we choose, like, if we squeeze it together in one direction, then it gets bigger. And this is by a factor maximum of the scaling factors divided by the minimum of the scaling factors. Furthermore, we could show, this is by Pythagoras, you can... You can see that in the article that uh, disk is a, um, a square root of two um, gamma set, okay? Just to get a feeling how big the gamma should be. And furthermore, we see actually every reasonable set is a gamma set, but not when we have any sort of loop like um, an eight or something, then you have a point where the phi u and the phi w are the same for two different points, u and w, okay? So these are not gamma sets. Okay, and under this assumption on the, so if the support of F is now a gamma set, then we can show that the sample rectangular support, so the one we can compute with the pixels and the true one of the deformed version of, of our template function are, at, are the same up to a term gamma divided by D. So if gamma gets bigger, then we need a higher resolution. Yeah, please. That begs the question that you immediately have a problem when your sets are not simply connected, no? Because I mean, exactly when, the, when you don't know whether you have a figure of eight or just almost a figure of eight, mm -hmm. On the scale of your grid, you will you mean have trouble. Two different uh, objects, or well, it's it's so you're assuming it's a single, it's simply coming, connected. Yeah, yeah, that it's I think it's only one object, so it's not that you have like two two circles or something. So it does not have holes, basically, or what? Or Sorry, I, didn't. Holes. I can have holes. It does not have holes, or what? 
Um, but for example, if I'm like that, it means that you can go through oh, me and going through Yeah, holds are also not included. Yeah. So simply connected. Basically. Yeah. Simply yeah. connected, yes. I'm, I have to think about the whole. I mean, the usual problem in, in analysis, like in all sort of Parker inequalities, is like our class is your problematic case. And our class is basically the thing that has a huge gap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, but for now we assume it's a gamma set. The spurious, uh, the spurious disconnection due to the grid, this is controlled by this non-dimensional parameter gamma divided by D. Mm -hmm. So this is a length divided by mm -hmm. length, and that's uh, small. Eliminated, of course, only up to necks that are thinner than. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let me state the main result for this classifier. So the first thing we need is okay, in the data set, at least both of the labels have to occur one time, but it's enough if both labels are there at least one time. Then the two template functions fulfill that they are gamma set and lip sets. Furthermore, we had that the object has to be completely visible. And we say that this psi n here is just the maximal scaling factor which, which occurs in our training sample. Furthermore, we need that the rectangular support has, is large enough also of an order one over d and there's also a gamma in it. I mean that the, like the rectangular support, the length and the, the, the width of it, the height of it are of this size here. It's maybe kind of confusing to write it like this. Uh, and then we need a separation criterion. So we need that the two template functions lie at least by a factor one over D multiplied by a constant, which again um, is depending on gamma and also on the scaling factors apart from each other. And if we have these assumptions, then this classifier separates our classes perfectly. And let me a bit comment on the separation criterion. We could actually show that this is an optimal criterion in a way that if we choose this separation criterion so that the classes are a part of by a factor of one over 80, then we can generate exactly the same data points by either applying the template function F1 or a deformed version of the template function F0, okay? And I thought about it for a while, and it kind of makes sense that also we humans need some sort of a separation criterion. And I, I'm not sure if you know this image of sheepdogs and mobs, but at some point, you might also unable to distinguish between a sheepdog and the dog. So we also need uh, some sort of a separation between classes to be 100% sure if it's the one class or the other. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so this was the first classifier. The second classifier, sheepdog. <laughs> it's a special like. Some, some of them are sheepdogs. There's no sheep. Some of them are no sheep. Good luck. Some but some dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're looking for a sheep, machine like learning that. didn't work. It's <laughs> <laughs> not an entirely serious comment. <laughs> huge okay. classification error. So this is a type of dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 okay. okay, and the second classifier we were analyzing are convolutional neural networks. And I'm not sure how much you know about them. I think most of you heard about it, and most of you might also have an idea what is going on. But let me quickly sketch what is happening. So, the convolutional neural network actually consists of three components convolutional pooling and fully connected layers. And as the name of this network tell us, the convolution is actually the important part. And in a convolution, we define so-called filters, and you can think about filters as a, only a small weight matrix. And this weight matrix is either applied to the input image or in later convolutional layers to a so-called feature map, which is again like um, an image. So it's also a matrix with matrix with weights. And what is happening in this convolution is that we slide these filters over the image and at each position where the filter stops, we compute the sum of the Hadamard product between the, the um, weights of the matrix and the pixels which are covered at this position, okay? And what is important here is that this filter doesn't change during this procedure. 
So it stays the same filter for the, for the whole convolution on this image. And to be able to extract high level features, we apply in one convolutional layer several filters. So um, this is why we generate in the end here in this example, six different feature maps. So we apply different filters and then generate these, these maps. Neural net, your prototype F0 and F1 and allowing, you know, and the features that come from uh, what you were doing before, or are you starting over again doing something that doesn't take advantage of your, your pre you have this nice nearest neighbor test statistic. So this is a different approach. Yeah, why different? Why not let the, these good statistical test statistics be inputs to your neural yeah, nets? Yeah, yeah. That's what we were doing in the 80s yeah, and 90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and, and in the, the 70s end, before, so it's getting later. What? <laughs> yeah. In the end, I want to discuss a bit how one could also combine these methods to maybe solve like more complicated images. But for now, we like use yeah, now. This is what people are doing now. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And in the end, we apply then the activation function, which is applied component wise on the matrix. Okay, and we also write it in a more mathematical manner, and we are only considering one layer convolutional neural networks. So this network consists of one convolutional and one pooling layer. We describe this convolution by the star here, and we have k different feature maps, which means we have k different weight filters we apply. And then component-wise, this um, activation function, which is the ReLU function, is applied. And then we apply a so-called one global max pooling layer. So a max pooling layer, layer usually reduces the complexity of the networks. So it moves over the image, stops, at, and extracts from different patches of the feature maps the maximal or the average value. But in our special network, we use the, that we just extract from the whole matrix we get in the end the largest value. And this is why I write it here with this infinity norm here. So we get in the end a k-dimensional vector as an output, and we uh, abbreviate this, this class by fc1 and k, okay? And then we apply several fully connected networks, and this is the definition you all know. What is maybe special, because we are talking about classification, is that we apply in the end a softmax function. The softmax function has this form and it maps in the end the output between zero and one and makes sure that when you add these, when you sum up these two guys, then it's exactly one. Okay. And then this is the, the definition we have already seen in beginning this week, I think. So it's just matrix vector multiplication. Then we apply our shifted version of, of a ReLU function. So here's already the bias in it. And uh, in the end, the softmax function, okay? And this fully connected network is now uh, abbreviated by f of l and k. So k is the number of neurons in, this, in the hidden layers, and l is the number of, of uh, hidden layers. And the parameters have to be trained during the, for example, applying a stochastic gradient descent. Okay. Sorry again? Phi beta is really outside, uh, so it's just the... You activate the output. Yeah, you can think about also applying a new activation function, but it's a different one compared to the others. So the others yeah. are real. But, but, but my question is, there is no extra WL plus one left of phi beta. No, 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 exactly. Activate the output. Exactly, yeah. because otherwise you're not sure that you're between zero and one. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm at the same place where Andrew was. Uh, so you, you're not using shifted and uh and scaled versions of your image as well you're only using the real images that you feed through this are you feeding through this also shifted versions also shifted versions ah, okay. so the whole deformation model is is in the way. maybe i got your question okay. then wrong okay we're good <laughs> <laughs> It's just instead of doing the k, the k, the one near, nearest neighbor, you do this. Exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And now I fixed the architecture a bit because it's easier. So my network has now so m is the integer. My network has now two m feature maps, and then I choose corresponding to this a number of of uh, fully connected layers of logarithmic depth, and these fully connected layers have a um, a width of four m, and in the end you have 
the, the probability vector, which is two, because we are binary classification. And the input of this fully connected layer is exactly the size of our feature maps. It's, uh, right now, it's just an integer. So it, it, it depends. So it's, it goes in the constant in the end, so how many filters we choose. But I, I will pre, uh, write this down in, on a later slide. OK, and the first thing you might already know is that CNNs are invariant under shifts. Why is this the case? We use the same filter for the whole image, so it doesn't matter if the cat is, or let's say the MNIST, the four is in the upper left corner or the lower right corner. In the end, we compute this convolution, and as we apply um, global max pooling, so we extract the maximal value, we will get exactly the same result. If we have the values on the upper left or the lower, the lower right corner, it's just a permutation of the matrix, okay? The second question we were dealing with is, is it also, so are CNN scale invariant? And is it even desirable to construct a scale invariant CNN? And the answer is actually, so we, we checked a bit the literature and most of the people say that it's not desirable to construct a scale invariant CNN because different scales often come with different resolutions. And when you have like, a low number of pixels, so a low resoluted image, then smaller images or smaller objects are harder to detect on that and vice versa. So if we have a filter which is invariant to this, we might get a higher misclassification error. Okay. Okay. And we need to change, before I introduce the main, or before I show you the main result, we need to to change a bit the classification problem because now we get a probability vector as an output of our network. So again, we have this data set, but this time it's not enough to have only one from each label, at least one, um, one training uh, sample, but we, we have to draw these labels from a Bernoulli distribution with a success probability pi. So what does this mean? We, in, in, um, expectation, we have m times pi many data points of, um, of label one and n times one minus pi many data points of label zero in this data set. And then we define our vectors yi as standard vectors, which have either at position one or position two or one, which corresponds to the label zero or the label one, okay? And what is missing, so what we, we need, um, as a pre-processing step for our network is that we have to normalize these pixels to um, get, a, get pixel values which are not depending on the brightness factor anymore. So this is now the input of these convolutional networks. Okay, and then we define, or we choose the network out of the function space of convolutional neural networks I'd introduced before, which minimizes this least squares loss here. And one can rewrite this least squares loss as this, this guy here, I'm not sure if I have to write it down, but if you think about it, that Y is only one minus KI and KI as entries, and P1 and P2 can be written like, so P1 is one minus P2, then you get exactly this here, okay? So in the end, our, um, our CNN is actually an estimator for the upper story probability, so the probability that our image is, has level one given our image. And we search this in a way that the least squares error is small. Okay. Okay, and this is the main result we could show. So again, we need to assume the object is completely visible. And here is now the, the M specified. So we choose the, the size of M as two CD plus one squared. C is only an integer again. And k hat is a classifier which is based on our p hat. We choose the beta in our um, softmax function as d squared. We just fix this xi here, and we choose the number of samples larger than d to the five of log four to d, which is pretty high. And again, we need a separation criterion. It's a bit different to the one before. It's actually more general. So it's again of order one over d. And what is important to see is here, we don't need this gamma sets here in this approach. 
this is the difference. And in the end, we get a misclassification probability or misclassification error, which is bounded by one over root D. Okay. And what is it? What is now interesting here is we are not anymore confronted with the curse of dimensionality. So this time we even benefit from a higher resolution, a higher dimension, because then our um, misclassification error tends to zero for d to infinity. Yeah, please. Norm is squared. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Norm is squared in the infimum. It's a symmetric expression. Exactly, it's symmetric. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure you're catching it. You have a L2 for on the, the first infimum, and the second infimum, you have an L2 squared. Oh, this is a, a typo. A sorry, typo. it's a typo. It's a both should be squared. Squares. Yeah, it's a square. Sorry, this is a typo. So now you have a distribution. Maybe I'm just so sorry. Now you yeah. have a distribution over the, the different deformations. Uh, and the the deformations are like randomly chosen, but on the it has to be so they're not completely randomly because the object has to be yeah, yeah sure but but I mean this p is now so x is random in the sense we still only have f zero f one and so the x is now essentially a random transformation or what exactly yeah yeah exactly right. so yeah. And then what's the distribution of these is it like uniform in the Possible of the set. deformations, you mean? Yeah, yeah you could choose it uniform. Also, oh, this P is, is for any. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah at least. I, mean, just, I, don't, I don't get how it can be completely independent of M. How it can be completely independent of the number of sample of the probability? You know, I, I, don't I know mean, it's not completely that. independent because you need like N to be large enough, right? Okay. Since n is well, you just have some sort of plus one on uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, n squared, exactly. which you store up in the constant. Yeah, okay. I think in this, I case, in this case, I will make it. Okay. No, it's, so it, there's no n in the constant anymore. Then you no, no, no. I was, it, I was saying that you probably got some asymptotic thing, which is d to the minus a half plus something n, n, n one over n exactly. squared, and then you absorb it. Exactly. One over, it's, it's exactly like this. Well, large enough n, you can absorb it in the constant. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to discuss a bit why this is now interesting compared to previous results. So in most of the previous results, we have a non-vanishing prediction error. And this is mostly the, so the reason for it is that we have some sort in randomness in the test sample, which is not covered by the training sample. And we could consider the example, uh, uh, as in, like, to illustrate it, we could consider a non parametric regression setting. And now this sigma here is our uh, fixed variance. And then if we want to find an estimator for, for recover this um, or for solving this regression problem, we, we would say, okay, y hat is now fn hat. And then this L2 error here can be decomposed in, in um, the in the sigma squared and an error which approximates, or here, here we have kind of approximate the, uh, how good we can predict the, the function f of x. But what does this tell us? Even if we are able to completely recover the function f, we would at least have a prediction error of, of size sigma hat, okay? And we, we have similar findings in classification or it's sim classification and regression are kind of related to each other when the uh, upper story probability lines lies strictly between zero and one. So we achieve these small, small misclassification errors if the conditional class probabilities lie either super close to zero or to one. Yeah, please. I don't mean, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, and the second idea would be um, that we could use our model as a data augmentation model. So we could just take a few training samples and then deform our new images with this model. The problem which then occurs, and because we didn't do it yet, is that we have then a dependent um, training sample. And this makes the statistical analysis completely different because we are always working in the setting that we have an independent uh, sample. Okay, and this is the, the proof, I, the idea of the proof is actually pretty simple. 
So the first thing is that we can, or that we showed that the label K can be described as a deterministic fun function, which is evaluated on the image point X. And this means that the apostory probability and the label itself are exactly the same. So P of X, so the, the apostory probability is either one or zero. And this helped us to, to bound this misclassification error by this term here. So in the end, it's a regression problem. We have to bound the apostory probability here. And then we use standard results from empirical process theory, which helps us to decompose this error here in two terms, namely an approximation error and an error which measures, measures the sample complexity. The approximation error is a is a lot of theoretical work. We have to describe the network, but in the end, we can show that this term here holds. And if we choose the beta as before, so as d squared, then this approximation error tends to zero. The second term was actually so solved by Bartlett and co-authors because they could show that we can bound the VC dimension of networks by its number of parameters. And by combining this, we could finally show this result. Okay, I will skip the simulations. We did some simulations. Yeah. Assuming about how the parameters of the convolutional network are trained, are you assuming that they are optimizing? Exactly. We assume the empirical risk minimizer. So, yeah. so it's somehow it magically. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, so I will skip the simulations. It's also not the, the simulations we, you will see in the end in the in the paper. So we're running more convolutional neural networks right now. And let me conclude very quick. So by this project, we wanted to give you a new perspective, or maybe it's an old perspective, which is was just forgotten, uh, on the theoretical analysis of, of image classification. What we have seen is that in our setting, the performance of the classifier even improves the higher dimension, but the, the number of samples is more minor in this setting. And as I said, there are many, many possible extensions, so it's really just the foundation. An idea would be to add some background noise. If you assume that the background noise is much lower than the, the noise or than the values of the object, you could might use approximate uh, <coughs> sets to also compute the rectangular support in the end. Then one could ask, how could we solve the problem with multiple objects? Here, when we have the, the case that the multiple objects do not overlap, we could partition this image in several parts and then apply our approach on the separate <coughs> parts. Then there's the idea to replace the constant shift by functions. This was actually done by Stefan Mala and uh, I think John Huna. Um, um, and they were then able to describe local deformations, but then it's not that we don't want to have invariant estimator anymore, then we need some other conditions because otherwise we, we would get a higher, um, a higher misclassification error. And the last thing, and this is kind of a connection to also ODEs, would be to use some ideas from image registration, especially in the medical field, this is used a lot. And there's one, one uh, famous model, which is called the Dartle model. So we could describe the, um, the deformations by, sol by solving an ODE. So by solving this, this kind of equation, and then at the, 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 the image before the deformation is x0, and the image after the deformation is x1. And yeah, then we could start to analyze these kind of models. But these are just ideas for extensions, so I think there are many more for now. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>